Welcome to Inspiring China, a channel that brings you insights of technology, business, and lifestyle. Don't forget to click the subscribe and notification button. Share if you like it. Your support is my motivation. In recent years, data security and privacy has become one of the major focus for most governments in the world. In a paper published by policy research organization Fox EU, citizens and firms have become increasingly dependent on data-driven services such as artificial intelligence. And apps, yet the personal data are not adequately protected at the national level. As a result, they have also become more vulnerable to theft, hacking, and misuse. Meanwhile, defense and national security officials have also become more dependent on data-driven services, from drones to tanks. Data are now at the heart of national security. According to the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. Only 66% of the countries in the world has data protection and privacy legislation. 10% of the countries has draft legislation, and 19% has no legislations at all. China has also started looking into data-related law, which subsequently result with several legislations implemented or drafted for public consultation in the last few years. Cybersecurity law that becomes effective on 1st of June 2017. E-commerce law that become effective on 1st of January 2019. Data security law was drafted with public consultation having closed on 16th August 2020. And personal information protection law just closed for public opinion on 19th November 2020. In this episode, I have invited Alex Roberts, a practicing lawyer in Shanghai, to talk about legislation status in China today. Welcome to Inspiring China, and today、uh, we have、um, the honor to have Alex from、uh, Link Leaders、uh, Shanghai office to join us, and he's a lawyer,、uh, practicing lawyer in Shanghai, and、uh, so welcome. Thank you, Greg. Nice to be here. Okay, so、uh, one exciting topic, and、uh, I hope it's not going to put everyone to sleep, but、uh, it's certainly a very important topic that we'd like to discuss is the cybersecurity. So tell us about the.、Um, Uh, China cybersecurity law. Yeah, so、um, the cybersecurity law is the first comprehensive、um, piece of legislation that we had here in China when it was released in、um, 2017, which actually regulates、um, cyber networks here in mainland China.、Um, I think what's interesting about the law is actually in terms of the chronology, in terms of how it was released. So we had two drafts that came out before the final form. But interestingly, the first of those drafts was actually released just five days. After the National People's Congress, which is the highest legislative body here in China, but actually the largest、um, parliament by number of members in the world, but、um, just five days after they released the national security law,、um, which was released back in、um, 2015.、Um, but the closeness of the release of those、um, pieces of legislation really shows how closely interlinked. Cyber security and national security are here in China,、um, and indeed, I remember back in February 2014,、um, President Xi Jinping himself actually said that without cyber security, there is no national security.、Um, so this national security thread is a very important、um, concept to remember when we're looking at and thinking about the cyber security law here in China. Is there a、um A unique approach to blur the national security and、uh, cyber security. Yeah, no, it's a, it's an interesting question. I don't think the Chinese government is the only government that's looking at this as an issue.、Um, we see is actually a trend amongst governments around the world to, as economies and、um, businesses, everyday life、um, has very much increased in terms of digitalization. Governments around the world are grappling with how、um, cyber security and national security、um, interplay. Um, so you might remember back in、uh, the summer last year, we had the U.S. administration under President Trump、um, releasing executive orders against TikTok and WeChat,、um, very much looking at how U.S. citizens' personal information、um, was being gathered by these apps and maybe that having a national security issue.、Um, similarly, in China, we had the sorry in、uh, India, we had the ban against、uh, Chinese apps for similar reasons. Um, but even in my home country of the UK,、um, or as further as field as Indonesia, we actually see these two governments looking at introducing new national security laws, which very much、uh, cover and supervise、um, cyber networks as well. So something that we're seeing as a trend across the globe. 
for the next question, I think a lot of people are asking, uh, especially people outside China, is that uh, uh, there seem to be no uh, data privacy law in China today, and uh, and how to protect the data confidentiality, you know, for the uh, people uh, living or working in China, and what's your view on that? Yeah, I think historically that might have been the perception. Um, I think here in China, we've always had a very much a scattered approach to data privacy in terms of the laws and regulations that we have at a national level. So for instance, there are principles set out under the Chinese constitution or the tort liability law, the Chinese criminal law. Um, but then we also have the overlay of, a, of sector specific rules. So um, data privacy rules that are set out to regulate how it operates in the internet um, industry, um, financial services, telecoms. But obviously China is also a, a vast country, as you'll appreciate, Greg. So even at a local level, different munis municipalities, um, cities or regional governments actually also have their local rules and interpretations. So here in Shanghai, for instance, we have the uh, Shanghai uh, Consumer Protection Rules, which add another layer. So I don't think it's fair to say that we haven't had rules. They're just scattered um, across the regulation playbook. Um, and maybe that has made it less obvious how they are enforced in practice. So coming back to cybersecurity law, is there any latest changes that is worth noting? I think the biggest change that um, stands out for me is since we've had the cybersecurity law since 2017, is really in terms of the approach to enforcement. There's really been an increase and encouragement for government agencies to enforce data privacy laws here. Um, and the cybersecurity law really is seen in the same way as the GDPR in Europe is the set of rules that people look to for data privacy. The cybersecurity law plays that role here. Um, so for instance, we have seen the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology actually publishing on a quarterly basis um, lists of companies that have been publicly censured for um, violations of data privacy, data protection rules here. And indeed, um, we've had individuals that have been prosecuted and imprisoned for um, effectively stealing other individuals' um, personal information and, and selling it um, without authorization. So enforcement, I would say, has been the biggest change, one of the most um, mark marked changes since the cybersecurity law came out. That's cool. A majority of the inspiring China audiences actually live outside China. Uh, I'm sure they're interested in the China data privacy law as compared to the Western standard. So Alex, why don't you walk us through that? Yeah, I think for those that are not familiar with the Chinese regime in terms of cybersecurity data protection, it's actually interesting to note that actually the regulators here for a number of years have been looking to the EU's um, GDPR as a model or a gold standard for how um, we should look to um, enhance our rules here and actually the Chinese government is not dissimilar to a number of governments around Asia that actually use the GDPR as a sort of gold standard for when looking to change their data protection regimes and actually this is actually exactly the case um, for the new personal information protection law that was released in draft for consultation here in China last October. When you look at a number of the provisions there, there are a lot of similarities in terms of the core principles between the EU's um, GDPR and now the new China law. So how about give us some examples? Yeah, so one of the um, obvious examples is the scope of personal information. So under the, um, the Chinese cybersecurity law, the definition of personal information is any information, whether itself or combined with other information, actually reveals the identity of the individual. So this could be your, your name, your age, your address, your contact details, for instance. And this is very similar to the definition under the GDPR. Um, one point of uh, difference, if you like, um, the GDPR also has a concept of special categories of information, personal information, um, sensitive personal information. Um, and we don't have that under the statutes here in China. But what we do have under the sort of best practice guidelines that have been released is a, a concept of personal information, which would be any information which is, if it is lost, leaked or revealed, um, could have a detrimental effect on um, the person's health um, their, their, their property um, or, or some wider aspect of, of their life or livelihood. Right. Um, so again, they're very similar. Okay. And in terms of the um, Chinese government wanted to enhance the protection of citizens' interest, you know, can you elaborate a bit mm. further on that? Sure. So one of the interesting principles under the GDPR is to give um, data subjects, so individuals, um, 
certain rights um, over how their personal information is, is handled or processed. Um, so for instance, you have the right for your um, for inaccuracies in your data as it's stored on a company's database, for instance, to be corrected, or the right to be forgotten, as it's called, if, for instance, you want your account to be deleted with an organization. Um, one interesting right that you have under the GDPR is for your data to be ported or transferred to a third party. Now, under the cybersecurity law here, the first two of those apply, the right to have data deleted or um, the right to have um, corrections made. Um, we don't have the data portability right. But again, when we look at the best practice guidelines here in China, which actually I find a lot of sizable consumer-facing businesses actually follow when they are drafting, preparing their privacy policies, is to actually replicate very similar rights that you would have under the GDPR. So at the end of the day, the protections that individuals have, the rights that they have um, in Europe under the GDPR are, are pretty similar to what we have here in China. Cool. Okay, so what are the key differences of the uh, two regime? Yeah, so one of the standout differences, I think, is in terms of data processing conditions. So the GDPR has very distinct processing conditions. So these are the conditions that must apply if an organization, a company, um, is, a, is able or wants to process um, an individual's data. So um, key processing conditions are compliance with a legal obligation, for instance, um, or to perform a contract between the organization and the individual, or if the organization has the consent of the data subject. Now, interestingly, here in China, we only have um, the consent um, as the sole statutory um, processing condition here in China. Okay, so in reality, what, what does that mean? I mean, arguably that means that um, you could see the GDPR as being more flexible, providing uh, it's more business friendly, in that businesses don't need to, in all circumstances, go out to customers or employees and get their written consent to process um, information. Or if we think about a, an internet or a mobile scenario, you don't have to check a box um, or, or, or have a click on a click through um, if the company is going to legitimately um, process your data. Well, certainly an interesting time when you look at the uh, data protection in China today. So uh, can we uh, briefly touch on the subject of the EU data transfer policy and also <laughs> the uh, most recent demand from European lawmakers about Facebook keeping the uh, European citizens' data onshore. Yeah, sure, Greg. No, you're right. It's an interesting time, and I think what you're referring to here is the Schrems 2 case that we had last summer, which was a decision against Facebook um, from the European Court of Justice. Um, and if you draw down the interpretation, the essence of that from a company perspective, companies like Facebook and others that are actually operating in Europe have um, activities there in the EU, they have to think about whether personal information that they send from the European Union um, can actually be sent to other jurisdictions and they have to make analysis as to whether those other destination jurisdictions actually have intrusive national security or surveillance rules. So in the case with Facebook, um, the court was looking at the US, um, but other jurisdictions that are perceived to have these sort of regimes are India, uh, Russia, and interestingly in the context of what we're talking about today, uh, mainland China, but also the Hong Kong uh, Special Administrative Region. And so as from Facebook perspective, I mean, should they move the business elsewhere or what, what should they do? I think that would be an extreme um, option for them. Um, this assessment needs to be made, but without looking necessarily at companies or countries specifically, I think the Schremer's 2 case is really part of a wider um, fragmentation that we see um, and have seen over the last 12 to 18 months of the digital economy. Um, there's really been an increase in terms of nationalistic protection, if you like, of technology and indeed um, data ownership and therefore cross-border data flows is something that's come under the spotlight. Um, so it means for companies that I work with and what I hear from other companies that are operating on a cross-border basis is they need to think about long term what their strategy is if they want to continue to operate on a cross-border basis. Do they need to disassociate their operations from certain markets that they're working in um, by moving their headquarters for instance or um, restructuring business divisions, maybe quarantining data in a particular jurisdiction, a particular market like the EU with the Facebook case um, or, or otherwise maybe change personnel. But 
there's no one size that fits all and it's something that we're going to have to see how it plays out over the coming months and possibly years. And this seems to be a global phenomenon in terms of regulation tightening up, right? That's, that's definitely true. Um, and you know, in the US we've got the new administration, the Biden administration, and we, we don't know mid to long term how they will react. Last summer we had President Trump and his administration with certain executive orders, um, but there's a change in administration and these things are evolving um, almost on a daily basis. Okay. okay. So I guess I, um, I guess to sum up this um, today's session is really the cybersecurity laws were launched in what uh, mid 2017, and that's the first legislation in China so far as the Chinese um, cyber networks. And uh, such a setup in cybersecurity is quite similar to what other countries have been doing, and to enhance specific to enhance the network security as well as the national security, and the data privacy principles um, exist in different Chinese law and constitution for a long time. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, most recently, the, um, the upcoming Personal Information Protection Law, PIP, which is um, drafted late 2020, will be quite similar to what the GDPR uh, gold standard, as you described earlier. That's is, that, right. is that fair That's to say? That's a good summary. Thank you, Greg. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more interesting topics, and don't forget to leave your comments. See you in the next episode.